we go. All right, well, happy Pride Month, everyone, and welcome to the June 27th, 2024 meeting of the Technical Advisory Council of the Confidential Computing Consortium. If you have shown up here and you do not know what any of those words mean, then I am shocked. And I think there must be an interesting story why you're here. Uh, but for everybody else, you're here because you are equally excited to help secure the world uh, by protecting data in use and doing it through open source collaboration. Uh, everybody's welcome to jump into the conversations that we have here, contribute in our open source code and our documents. And if this is your first or second time here, you're gonna be invited to introduce yourself in uh, just a few slides here. Because we have competing companies that are collaborating here, we also abide by the antitrust policy from the Linux Foundation. And you can go to linuxfoundation.org slash antitrust dash policy to read more about what that is if you are not familiar. <clears throat> Today, we have three main topics. Um, I think we might have a, just a couple announcements. Uh, so something slightly more than none. And uh, the three main topics are uh, Alec talking about the ecosystem goals for, for the TAC, which will include uh, things that we do through the GRC SIG. And then if we have Mark Novak, uh, he has shared a paper. We do have Mark. Um, that the GRC SIG is finalizing, and we can go through that. And then we have a new project proposal from our new colleagues at TikTok. And I think that will bring us to time. Were there any other uh, agenda items that people expected today? OK, well. Uh, we don't, uh, I don't think we're going to do any votes today, but as long as we've got some, uh, as long as we have uh, such good attendance, we'll just kind of quickly roll through. We, we talked to David at the outset. Do we have anybody from ARM today? <clears throat> do not see ARM present. Uh, I think I saw Catherine. Yes, Catherine, thanks for joining. Uh, this time's always bad for Howard. I am here. We have Henry or Kevin. Yes. Thanks for joining, Henry. And Alec, one of our presenters. Thanks, Alec. Fritz. I'm here. Ah, Fritz. Uh, I chanced upon one of the folks that you recruited for a tech talk and invited him to give a tech talk. And he said, I'm already scheduled. So uh, that was fun. You. And then, <laughs> yep, uh, Yash, I already saw you join in chat there about uh, the cricket. And then several folks from TikTok, including Ming Shen. Uh, all right, <clears throat> great attendance today. All right, now we're at the time where if this is your first time attending, uh, we like to get to know each other so that we're more comfortable collaborating. So just let us know how you like to be addressed and where you're coming from and what your interest is in confidential computing. Uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, Cosmin. I um, am currently joining from Munich, but I'm originally from Romania. Um, I have just finished my master's at the Technical University of Munich, and I have been working since my bachelor's thesis <laughs> with um, trusted computing hardware, uh, trusted execution environments. And uh, during my master's, I studied a trusted machine learning model execution on um, uh, cheaper hardware, so to say. So Intel SGX and how you can leverage GPUs and enclaves to train faster models inside a uh, TE. And um, today I was invited by uh, Fritz. I am also an intern at NVIDIA, and he recommended <laughs> this, um, this meeting. Well, that's fantastic. We're glad to have you here. And Fritz, thanks for uh, bringing someone along. Cosmin is also uh, currently on the market, eh? so anyone who wants to uh, hire a good person, uh, feel free to reach out to Cosmin and uh, read ping him for any cool positions you may have. Excellent. Yeah, I'm, 
I'm also searching for a full-time position. <laughs> well, what, what a great background, particularly for the audience that we have here. Uh, hey, I hope that anybody uh, has Cosmin, I, I, I don't think we can hire you, but I'd love to talk to you. We are a tiny startup, so we don't have the means to hire you, but you know what you... What you're working on is quite interesting to us. So I'd, I'd like to connect. I'll connect with you on LinkedIn and like to have a call. Maybe course, we can find a way to work together. Yeah. Okay. Any hiring good. that happens on this call, I expect at least a 10% commission on the first <laughs> year's salary, all right? That's, that's how it's going to work. All right. Well, thanks again for joining, Cosmo. All right. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, I'm Deli. Uh, co-founder of Automata. I'm based in Singapore. Uh, so I had a chance to join the uh, summit uh, in San Francisco like uh, just a few weeks ago. Also at, at that time, I get to know like consortium and got interest. Had a, also had a pleasure talking to Mike about like just some of interesting topics like attestation and stuff. So we're actually uh, a startup building a um, couple of like decentralized services, including like doing attestations on chain for hardware. Uh, so we have actually open sourced a uh, solidity library that does the uh, attestation, I mean, verifications for the uh, Intel uh, DCAP attestations for Intel SCX. <clears throat> also, we are working on something like the uh, Zikified version so that we can um, lower the cost of verifications on chain. So yeah, this is the uh, kind of the area we are working on. Well, another exciting area. Uh, always need to see how people can use confidential <clears throat> computing to bring new behaviors into complicated environments like decentralized uh, architectures. Thanks for joining, Delhi. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, if anybody else uh, later wants to introduce themselves, just feel free to uh, chime in as we go. Uh, but I think it looks like everybody has introduced themselves before. Um, last meeting, <clears throat> uh, we, we listened to some recaps from people who were able, uh, like Dilly, to attend the Confidential Computing Summit and uh, got good feedback on things that that happened there and i think we're all kind of excited already for the for next year's edition and john manfredelli who's also notably a uh, maintainer on one of our projects uh, came in and talked about his experience implementing one of the pqc algorithms and and got some conversation started on what we're what we're all doing with with post quantum algorithms and we will have another post-quantum talk coming up a little bit later this summer. Uh, so we'll be able to round out that conversation some more. And now might also be a good time because I didn't put in a separate slide for announcements. I think Sal has something. And then uh, if, if there were any takeaways from people from the uh, board meeting yesterday. I'm oh. curious, Dan, are, are the board minutes published somewhere or are they just circulated among no, the board? No, so yeah, it's just, just board members. Um, so uh, each, well, as a board member, uh, um, Alec, you have access to them. Um, and we do have representatives from the broader body, uh, from the general members, uh, of which Manu is one and Chris Ramming, I think, is another, who represent the the general members uh, on on these calls and can you know communicate things as required. And we can use this sort of uh, conversation as well, obviously, for for that. But that's that's how it works. So it's it's the only thing to which people are not in. Everyone is not invited. Uh, that and any legal uh, committee, we never really needed to do that particularly. So, and, Sal, I think. Uh, yeah, one quick point, uh, and then we can get on to new business uh, because it is new business. Uh, just a reminder for anyone with open source projects at the CCC, we have now opened up uh, the Linux Foundation mentorship support. And uniquely for the CCC, we can take <clears throat> a uh, mentor at any time. So, any three month period that works best for your project. 
Um, so get in touch with me, with Yash. Um, we've really been spearheading this mentorship program and uh, we're excited to get some new features and projects out there. So uh, yeah, especially for new projects coming in, keep that in mind. Thanks, Sal. Thanks, Yash, for, for getting that program underway. Uh, this list of up of mentors, you know, we'll need to come back around to that in another meeting to finish filling it out and uh, double checking. We still have engagement from everyone there. But part of what Sal just asked is if you are in contact with any of these projects, make sure that they are aware of the, the mentorship opportunity. So I have uh, some other business, if I may. Sure. <clears throat> so um, the uh, Pet, Sing Pet Summit Singapore, or Asia, in, which is in Singapore, happens in about three weeks now. Um, I will be yeah. going. Uh, Delhi will be there as well. Uh, and Jesse Schrater from uh, Intel and some other folks as well, speaking, doing uh, moderating bits and pieces and stuff like that. However, I'm... Um, so firstly, I would love to meet any uh, any customers, uh, ecosystem partners, colleagues of yours who are going to be in Singapore around uh, around then. It's the 16th, 17th of uh, July, I believe. <clears throat> I'm also planning to be in Seoul for the latter part of the week before that. So if you have colleagues in Seoul, South Korea, um, I would love to meet them as well. That's not firm yet, but it's looking pretty likely. So, yeah, colleagues, ecosystem partners, I'm, I'm not there to do a sales job for, for, for you, but on the other hand, I'm absolutely there to, to sell confidential computing. So, you know, partners and, and customers are absolutely appropriate uh, for me to work if, if that, to meet if we think that's going to work. So uh, please bear that in mind. It's a big trip, and I'd like to make the most of it um, because, you know, it's quite expensive for the CCC and... Uh, it's it's your guys' money, so uh, let's uh, let's see if there's anything we can do with that. Please get in touch with me or or Rian or uh, if Ben if uh, if that would be helpful. <clears throat> All right, great. Thanks for that, Mike. Hope that trip goes well. Thank you. All right, let's get into uh, the new business here. Uh, the oops, I had this tab up. So uh, I'm gonna turn things over to, um, to Alex I'm just here, but one of the ways that, that we make sure that we're doing something productive besides having interesting conversations is, is turning those interesting conversations to uh, something with output, something with impact. And so we're organized around three topic areas, three objectives, things that we want to provide some meaningful output on. Uh, and those are across, as you see there, projects, the ecosystem, and community. And the ecosystem one is meant to help address the problem that when we show up to conferences that aren't the Confidential Computing Summit, sometimes, a lot of times, <clears throat> people don't know what confidential computing is. Uh, and so we have a mixture of activities that happen also on the outreach committee, but, but within what we do in the technical committee to make sure that uh, confidential computing is recognized, particularly in, in things that affect uh, compliance requirements. Uh, and so Alec has, uh, as, a, as a voting tech member, has, has volunteered to take ownership of, of this part of it. Uh, and that's going to be in partnership, of course, with, with Mark on the GRC SIG. The the wording for, for those of you who don't use objectives and key results at your company, you, you want to be able to phrase something in a measurable way. So, you know, a, yeah, we, we have accomplished something. We, we're going to do three of these things. We got five. We overperformed. Uh, we got one of these things. We, we didn't really meet our goal. And so deeper in this document, uh, we have a, a template. And we didn't really enforce filling these out for the... Uh, for the different objectives that we have here. But part of what Alec will be doing is, is leading us through some discussion to um, make this goal more measurable and make us more aware of where we need to help <clears throat> satisfying that goal. Is that uh, sufficient framing, Alec? It sounds great, Dan. Thank you. And if, if it's okay with you, I'll just go ahead and share my screen and, and um, we can go from there. Uh, here we go. And coincidentally, 
Uh, let's see if you can see it yet. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yep. All right, awesome. Coincidentally, I had the exact same slide up as you, um, wanting to do the same framing. And just to make sure we're on the same track, I'll kind of go through it one more time. Um, first off, let me say that this is a little bit of a conflict of interest. You'd think those of us in the Confidential Computing Consortium would um, avoid conflicts of interest like this. But I serve on the GRC um, special interest group, that's Government Risk and Compliance Special Interest Group. I serve at the pleasure of Mark Novak, who's the chair of that GRC. So this is a little bit of a conflict of interest because it's a TAC <laughs> member. I'm also providing some oversight uh, for the special interest group. And Mark, I know you're here. Um, just kind of want to make sure that we go through this interactively because I see you as being a super effective chair and you've been driving a ton of work out of that SIG. So this is, I think, more of a checkpoint to make sure that the, the work that we're doing is easily reported to Dan, who serves as the TAC chair, and his alignment <laughs> with, the, with the tax objectives. So um, Dan, thanks for providing the overview there. <clears throat> uh, so just wanted to highlight this one right here. Um, identify influential compliance organizations and recommend CC in public documents. That's what we signed up to do uh, as a special interest group and wanted to pull up the charter document that Mark wrote when he um, proposed the special interest group. Um, so we can kind of review it in real time. Um, the goals of the SIG fall into two main categories, support the creation of regulatory frameworks, um, partner with regulators in crafting government's frameworks for confidential computing. Um, and you can kind of read this, but essentially what we want what we're trying to do is influence the standards bodies that drive the behavior of large organizations in getting their applications to be secure. And we're trying to educate those standard bodies on the benefits of confidential computing so that when they publish, compliance requirements that large institutions have to follow, that some of those requirements drive them towards adopting confidential computing. I think in a risk, that's, I mean, sorry, in a, in a nutshell, that's what we're trying to do as a special interest group. And so what I want to do is craft some key results that, um, that make sure that what we're producing is in alignment with those goals. And if either the goals are wrong or the work that we're producing doesn't meet those goals, then we need to make some changes. Hank, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, so um, quick philosophical rhetor. Um, I, I, I prefer to trust people who seek the truth than people who claim to have the truth. So this government's thing is instructing other SDOs on to do it right. What if they do it better? Is this a bi-directional process? Well, I can say that would be the end goal. I think what we would really like to do is engage in a conversation with these governmental organizations. Um, yeah. Spoiler alert, while we've been trying to initiate conversations with um, regulatory compliance organizations at the government level, yeah. Um, we we haven't been getting a lot of traction there. We've been sending uh, responses in to request for comments. Yeah, I'm there. Um, not. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or concluded to be okay and current architecture will improve. Blah, blah. Yeah, got it. Right. So um, that's the goal. Uh, okay. And I've actually got a call for help to try and engage those regulatory agencies and in, in conversations. So I'm going to kind of reach out to the general community and and ask for help with that. Okay, thank you. All right, cool. Yeah. Uh, okay, so here's here's what I'm proposing as key results. And again, Mark, I see you're on the meeting. I'd love to make this as interactive as possible. I don't want to just post these as, as being our key results. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to um, come up with uh, key results that are great for the GRC. And Dan, looking to you here, come up with maybe a template that other um, – special interest groups and projects can follow in creating the key results that you're looking for us to do as the TAC chair. So um, please feel free to interrupt me and blurt out comments and guide me through this. Uh, the, and I've 
I've kind of worked with Dan a little bit on on drafting these things. So we've got a, a little bit of a head start, but please feel free to to introduce your own ideas. Um, what I've got here is produce and written responses to requests for comments from key regulatory or standards bodies. And I've kind of broken them out into two categories of standards bodies, national regional governments like NIST, ANISA, ICO, CSA, and it's interesting, we've got two different CSAs that we're working with. One is the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore, which is a governmental agency. Um, and there's also the Cloud Security Alliance, which is a non-governmental agency. Uh, CPRA, which is a state level uh, agency in, in the United States, the state of California. Um, so that let me let me just pause there and see if anybody has any feedback about this as a key result. Is it specific enough? Is it um, is it too broad, not broad enough? Help me out, or should it just stand as it is? I suppose it is good. Uh, we've talked inside the GRC SIG about not just uh, doing responses to the information uh, requests or the internal reports and special publications, but also uh, publishing our own and hoping that they would publish it for or them for us. Would that be covered by a third bullet? Um... No, that's a little bit more specific. So let me capture that in real time here. Um, so what you're saying is produce documents. Oops, sorry, I'm editing in real time. Or perhaps collaborate with these organizations on authoring new guidance. Yeah, so that's kind of where I was, I think I was going to say, uh, it's kind of being the proactive, not just waiting for them to come up with RFCs, um, but trying to um, make contact with the right people. And again, sometimes that will be directly from the GRC. On other occasions, it may be, you know, saying, look, we have a we have people we can talk to, you know, Dan as head of the TAC or me as the exec, exec director, to sort of start conversations that can then move into other stuff. So I'd like to see, yeah. This, it's really hard work, this, and I should say we don't have enough people attending the GRC, and I always push for more more involvement with that. Um, and that's the difficulty with being proactive, but I do like it. Sorry, I'm struggling with... Tab Does... left character is to the... Uh, it's on the right edge of your toolbar. Ah, here, I see it. Thank you. Yeah. Boom. Mm -hmm. um, does this capture the sentiment of what you said, Mark? Collaborate with yes. security organs, new documents yes. to that inform their publications. So we'll say, yeah. uh, uh, organization plural. Yep. So since we're coming up on the end of June here, um, and December is typically a not very productive month. We've got July, August, September, October, November, so maybe five months of, of uh, runway here. Would you interact with one organization? Would you interact with three? What's a practical goal that you can collaborate with? I have with? to uh, highlight that I have a hand raised for the first item, and that might have been lost in translation somewhere. Apologies, Hank. I didn't see that you had your hand up. Please go. Sorry, Hank. Yeah, sure. So I, I see Enisa, which is kind of, of course, a regional um, start a regulation body to some extent. And there is a lot of EU Commission stuff happening. You know, the EIDs, the wallets, and the stuff in Europe. That's a pretty hot topic. Um, they probably could use some input to some extent and at some point. So is that in scope of that uh, target audience here, or is that not in scope? The EU Commission directly, or the EU of a you commission. So I think I think those fall squarely within the realm of government organizations, right? Then and, and regional governments. You said at the at the level of yeah. the EU. So I think that's very much very much the case. I didn't get that list though. So maybe you and I can work offline. Um, again, sure. I want to stress that it the 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 barrier that we're experiencing as a SIG isn't. Um, an inability to produce the work, it's an inability to gain uh, foothold in these bodies yeah, to start a conversation. Yes. That's right. 
Exactly. So in the EU, especially in the uh, EID uh, context, a, a civil uh, society consultation process has started, and uh, some people think there should be a uh, an actual advisory committee or something, and and the CCC could look at these things when they start to incubate. That's all I'm saying. Uh, I, hi, this is Nikolai from Canada. But speaking of European per, uh, perspective. In the EU, there's also right now the consultation on the cloud cybersecurity uh, certification scheme, which would be very relevant to get some input from the CCC. Is there a body? That, well, and, and again, so maybe what I'll do is I'll send a, an email out to the list. These are all great suggestions, and I want to capture this information in real time. It doesn't make sense for me to try and track down the list. I'll send out an email to the entire group, and I'll call. I'll call out um the folks who have commented here and asked for the list um i see a comment in chat about fedramp i can say fedramp i think takes their uh requirements from the national uh institute for standards and technology from nist so i can add them here they certainly fall in here but i don't think they publish uh the standards i think they consume standards from nist Okay, cool. So we've got so far. I think let's let's continue to drive this forward. I'm hearing that there's assent to getting these first two key results, and that we need to take those on as the SIG. Um, and then here's a third one: incorporate XCC controls into, and I should say XCC based controls. Oh, <clears throat> controls into end compliance organizations. What I'm trying to capture here is we have um, standards organizations that publish controls that are required by member institutions to implement, to provide security. For example, one of the controls is um, all data in motion has to be um, encrypted using the latest crypto technology. That's the way the standard is written. And it's a requirement for any um, member organization that adapts the control framework to encrypt all their network communications data in motion using what they say is the latest or or industry approved crypto standards what we're trying to do is go to those same bodies and amend the controls to incorporate the requirement that they protect data in use as opposed to in addition to data in motion and data at rest which they already require so this key result is for us to go to these publishers of standards and control frameworks and get them to add the requirement that they protect data in use in addition to data in motion and data at rest. Um, again, I'm going to try and measure that by saying we get X new controls added to N existing compliance frameworks. Um, an example that I have here is Cloud Security Alliance. That's a commercial non-governmental framework. PCI DSS is another commercial non-governmental framework that would benefit from confidential computing, and we're trying to measure our ability to influence them. Does that sound good to everybody in the tech so far? All right, great. Um, and then the last one that I have here kind of as a bonus, and this is one that Dan and I sort of discussed in real time during our syncs this week that I think is great. And I think we're sort of doing this, but we haven't targeted it as an actual key result. Produce documentation to in, inform standards and compliance orgs on how their security requirements map to specific technological features. So they might have loosely written security standards that say you have to protect data at all times. And what we want to do is map that to the fact that confidential computing requires that data in use be isolated and um, inaccessible by cloud service providers and non-authorized individuals. Uh, Dan, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, and, and um, the audience for this is actually our members and companies that we think want to adopt or should want to adopt confidential computing. So it's it's in my mind less about going to NIST and, and explaining to them uh, how confidential computing meets their existing requirements and more publishing on the CCC webpage. If you need to comply with GDPR, 
here are the aspects of confidential computing that satisfy GDPR requirements I, and do that for the top regulatory documents. For the, you lost me at top regulatory documents. So I was following you very closely and hundred mm -hmm. percent in alignment with um, the need to explain to the CCC community how our technologies help them meet existing compliance requirements. I would have thought that that would be something that the outreach committee might do, and I don't want to step on their toes. Help me understand where the tie is to the governance and risk and compliance, SIG. Well, we need a somewhat technical document and analysis that says GDPR says, like, like you were just giving the example, you have to protect data at all times. And so by protecting confidential computing lets you protect data in use. And so that capability satisfies line 512 from GDPR. Got it. And so we need to provide that yeah. analysis. We and need then, we need a corporate we need a corpus of material basically, which we can which uh, outreach can apply uh, and and disseminate. Is that fair, Dan? Yeah. Cool. Sorry, I talked over you. I do apologize. No, no, not at all. So the really the the change here is rather than informing standards and compliance orgs, it's informing. Um, members informing customers. I'm not sure what the right word is here. I'll just say the public. Ecosystem? Public. The public, yeah. Mm. Uh, how about ecosystem? Public is kind of like consumers, and I'm not sure this is what that's quite what you're looking at. I, mean, I could be wrong, but... Mm -hmm. And I think what we're trying to say is inform the CC mm -hmm. ecosystem on how CC technological features map to the security requirements published by standards orgs above. Does that make sense? Yep. All right, so now it's time to fill in the variables. And I think one document between now and the end of the year is aspirational. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll leave these above because I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I think this is starting to get into the realm of topics that the chair, the SIG chair owns. So I don't want to to have a public discussion here before the SIG chair has had a chance to reflect on um, the scope of these deliverables. So let, if, if with that, I will pause this conversation and we can go on to the next slide if everybody agrees or if there are no objections. I just had one nuance that some of this work will happen in the GRC SIG, but the GRC meetings already have you know a certain capacity so some of this work can and probably should happen outside of the sig where the sig doesn't have capacity for it and we can even use uh some of our our working time during the tac meetings for example to to help draft information would you say that the outreach uh the group would be good at deciding you know how to communicate with these bodies Because here's the thing, uh, the GRC SIG, our primary focus in on uh, creating, um, you know, uh, new control requirements, ultimately. But I agree with you that it's uh, very useful uh, for people to know, oh, if I deploy this technology, I, you know, I'll have an easier time complying with my existing requirements before new ones are introduced. So, you know, with that lens, the GRC SIG is the right uh, place to do that, and we should give it some attention. Uh, but also, I can see an argument why, where if you have an existing requirements uh, that you know the technology can help you with, outreach is how we inform. Yeah, so outreach can help us um, present the information, but like Mike suggested, creating that corpus of information 
is on the TAC and whether you know it's in the GRC or within a TAC meeting or, or some other breakout, um, it, it can be accomplished in, in yeah. any of those. Well, the GRC team is probably going to be uh, quite busy uh, with the stuff I'm hoping to present next, although I'm rapidly running out of time. I have uh, a work meeting at the top of the hour. Uh, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, w w we are looking at uh, a number of things that will keep us busy for a few months. But at the same time, I, I see this as very important and I would like to, uh, you know, definitely want to participate in creation of such guidance yes. so, so let me let me wrap up our conversation here i think what you're saying mark is that we need to continue to work with the tac on how other um sigs and and uh, committees can help us with this and i totally agree we just need to coordinate on that well, i'll close yeah. i'll close with this slide by saying um we're so, some of the some of these goals are already being accomplished um we're working with the csa to include data and use protection. And just to show you what that looks like, if you go to the CSA website, they've got the CCM um, implementation guidelines that members of the CSA are required to implement these security standards. And the latest version of that implementation guideline includes the requirement, uh, well, not the requirement, but it encourages customers to use trusted execution environments for data and use. So this is it, it illustrates two things. It illustrates how long this takes, because it was a lot of effort over six months, to include um, some confidential computing technology requirements in a very, very long publication that guides those members. And the adoption of CCM 4.0 is something that big banks have to spend budget on, right? New version of the CCM comes out. It's got brand new controls. Budget has to be approved. Work has to be done to comply with these brand new controls. Um, so this is how it starts, and this is what we're doing. Just wanted to give an mm -hmm. example. And with that, I'll wrap up and cede the remainder of my time to my esteemed colleague, Mark Novak. Thank you. And Mark, I'm sorry, I forgot you mentioned that you had that uh, that time. That's OK. Well, Alec is here, and he's my co-chair. so. Uh, yeah, when I need to drop, uh, Alex should be able to uh, take over. Okay, so uh, let's move quickly. I'm going to share uh, three links and put them in the chat. So what we've been working on in the GRC SIG is a set of governance patterns uh, uh, around confidential computing. So the first link I'm going to uh, drop in the chat is uh, a folder that we have. Uh, there we go. This is a folder containing four documents describing what's called the patterns language. So if we're going to write a pattern, turns out there is a methodology for doing so. The methodology is uh, not new. It's uh, many, many years old. And there is, in fact, a pattern uh, written for writing patterns. So it's, you know, that's how you know it's, it's, it's properly structured. So that's the first thing I encourage you to, uh, you know, look at it just so you know why we're doing things in the way we are. So the first pattern, uh, which is kind of a very small pattern that I want to share, and this is the expectations pattern. Uh, and so I'm putting the link in here again. If you don't have access, uh, please uh, you know, just request access and I get it in my Slack or email and I can rapidly grant access. So this is the document. And now I'm going to start sharing my screen. Uh, you know, uh, Please allow me. Alec, you have to stop sharing, I think. Oh, I apologize. Uh, or, I mean, you can if you want, Alec. That's perfectly fine, because uh, then you're going to be taking over at the top of the hour for me anyway. So please go ahead. Just open this document. And this is the document that has a nifty diagram that I'm personally quite proud of that basically says these are the classes of participants you will have in a uh, confidential environment setup. And uh, the arrows are numbered, and they basically show this is this class of participants is responsible to the following class of participants for stuff. And you can see that everyone's responsible to auditors and then the, not everyone is responsible to everyone else for everything. So, but 
uh, it's it's a cool diagram and the numbers on these arrows is what other patterns will be referring to so i'm not spending much more time on this but as you open these documents uh, you can participate in uh, our discussion uh, there are already some comments on it and uh, we'll, yeah coming up to this meeting we cleaned up as much as we could but there are still a few remaining okay so the first actual pattern uh, we're developing uh, i'm going to again uh, drop the uh, link here and uh, that's a uh, confidential payload governance and it's one in a series of patterns probably half dozen or so that we're going to develop over the next several months and this is basically here is the key point of this document if you take code written for your traditional uh, you know non-confidential environment and you do the naive thing and wrap it inside a trust execution environment and go run it. You are probably getting a false sense of security. And this document talks about these are the things you need to consider in order to ensure that your data in use protections are, in fact, strong. And it follows the same uh, patterns, uh, language structure. So. Uh, we have a context. This is sort of, you know, when you find yourself in a certain situation, you may want this pattern. So that's kind of a context is the scoping statement. Problem describes sort of the thing you might encounter if, if you are in subject to your context. And then the forces is the section that says, and this is what makes solving this problem difficult. And then when you scroll down, uh, these are the four things that we've identified. Now we're gonna we're not you know, going to do a review in this forum. It's probably just not efficient for that for that sort of thing. Please join uh, GRC SIG meetings. Uh, next one would be uh, July third. Uh, and the forces section in the four there are four categories of things that you need to worry about. And before I go into them, uh, for those of you who are not knee deep in uh, regulations as I am. Uh, there is a you know, governance is not uh, an inexact science, turns out. So at the top of governance, there are certain standards and you know, like you know, firm wide policies, things like that. Uh, they are general statements. So for the general statement might want, might be uh, you, know, you will institute secure development practices. Right? It's completely technology agnostic. It's just a bucket into which a bunch of things go. Into that bucket, you have uh, things like control objectives. And under control objectives, so control objective might be a key, a cryptographic key lifecycle management. That would be so a number of things that you need to put controls around when you manage cryptographic keys. And that will talk about things like key generation, key distribution, <laughs> uh, key decommissioning, key revocation. And then, uh, the, the, so that would be control objective. It would be, again, technology agnostic, uh, but at the same time, it would be uh, sufficient enough to say, this is how you prove to the auditor that you have satisfied the uh, control objective. So uh, so where you talk, talk about these forces, you're probably talking about specifically control objectives. So my control objective around secure code design and development, and I just add design literally <laughs> during this call because I just realized something else that, that, that can be a problem. Uh, so again, active documents, they're live documents. <laughs> Uh, so, and then you basically are you expected to provide evidence to regulators that you are satisfying uh, the terms of your control objective, and that's again it's completely technology agnostic, or as much as possible. Then you get into the next level, which is a control objective is satisfied by a set of control procedures, and control procedures would be the things that you actually did. And then the control procedures generate the evidence that the control objective uh, expects. So across all of your control procedures uh, taken together for a given control objective, you will generate all the evidence control objective demands. And that is something we don't do in the GRCC. We just suggest what might go in there because that is when it gets technology specific. Right. Uh, so again, that's where I'll stop. There are further levels of refinement. Uh, so as far as control objectives for your uh, confidential computing environment. Uh, they, we believe, fall into four categories. So the first one is your code needs to be designed and developed for a confidential environment because, again, naive uh, lift and shift of existing code is not going to do that. And there are 
couple of things that you need to worry about. So for instance, there, there's if, a hand mark if you want to, if you yeah, wanna, yeah. Uh, I, I didn't see that, but yeah, uh, David. Yeah, I guess I had a question on the previous page. Um, you said that, I think on the first thing that, right, that code is likely to contain a number of security vulnerabilities. Is there any evidence for that? I mean, you know, things like using secure network or proper crypto, I mean. So yeah, I, uh, there is evidence standard that, practice, of course. Right? So the, the last bullet, for instance, that I uh, added, uh, if you uh, execute your code confidentially, so now you're basically saying, you know, whatever this code is doing is going to be uh, protected from tempering. And then you go and issue this code a bearer token. So you give it a JSON web token. And then this thing goes and uh, sends that token to somebody and that token gets leaked. All of a sudden, some other piece of code can pick up your same token, get the access to the same data and go, you know, do the same computation no longer confidentially. So that can be a problem. Or if you fail to use the uh, random number generator that's provided by your trust execution environment and you use the platforms, RNG, all of a sudden the platform gets to dictate what keys you generate and all of a sudden you're not uh, secure anymore, et cetera. So yeah, you you will need to make certain changes uh, or at least think through what might happen. Uh, well, I would I... even argue, and again, if you want to, if you want to dig into these sorts of details, please join the GRC SIG. Uh, more than welcome. I want to hear all your inputs. It's just if we're going to um, you know, have that discussion here, we will effectively be doing the work of the GRC SIG here. Well, yeah, I guess my, my point is I'm not disputing that it's possible that you could have security vulnerabilities if you just move your code as is. But I guess I'm questioning the likely uh, word there because I think that a lot of these things would be considered standard security best practices already. And I worry a little bit that you're scaring people from taking advantage of confidential computing by saying that uh, your code is all of a sudden going to be vulnerable to all these things, even if you've already been practicing you know, secure code development. Oh, you can be practicing your secure code all you want, but if you cache your data without sealing it to the platform, you're screwed. So yeah, you actually need to give additional guidance to say, uh, mostly, yeah, you follow all the same security practices everywhere else, but we are uh, specifically pointing out, these are the things you need to pay attention to in addition, or else you may, you, 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 you think by uh, following existing, you know, best practices, I'm good. You're not. And you, n n it's not a universal statement, but I believe that any significant body of code that I lift and shift, I have to check for these things because if I don't, I'm not going to be secure. Okay, thanks. Okay. So the next category would be uh, the secure code build. So we actually believe, uh, and this is, again, it's a forward-looking statement, but if you, uh, you know, wrote perfect code, but your build chain is compromised, then you, again, cannot really trust the identity of that code for purposes of attestation. So we would recommend... Uh, putting controls in place uh, to ensure that your, uh, you know, I, I would, you know, for purposes of like, you know, how I would like to deploy confidential computing uh, with my employer, uh, I would like us to run compilers themselves uh, inside trust execution environments, because I don't necessarily trust administrators of the, uh, you know, build chains. And again, we can argue about how likely, but ultimately, the, these are not the things you must do. These are the things you need to think about, and then you decide. So the way the way you pass an audit is you say, these are our objectives, and then you may choose not to have an objective around secure code build, because that's not what you want to do. And then, you know, you and the auditor will hash it out. But if you commit to it, then the auditor will want to know that whatever you promised to do, you actually did, and there has to be evidence to that effect. So that's, that's really how it works. Then we talk about secure supply chain. So again, we believe that uh, you need to pay additional attention to uh, you know, actually ensuring, and again, for purposes of attestation, I would like us to have a much closer look at bills of materials and how we uh, you know, grant uh, tokens, gra grant credentials to confidential code in part based on the assessment that we can now make of uh, the uh, you know the bill of materials of uh, a particular uh, 
uh, you know, set of measurements. So again, we, we, we're working out some guidance on that. And so we're also talking about secure packaging, integration, configuration, deployment. So you can have, again, perfectly written code, but the uh, root the trust store in your container, your VM is corrupted. And all of a sudden it starts trusting things it's not supposed to. And again, your guarantees are out the window. So uh, again, we the goal here is not to reiterate existing practices. The, it's assumed that you're following existing best practices. We are, however, pointing out that a few things that uh, you know may give you a false sense of security uh, is, is, is across these different domains. And again, how an organization uh, you know, chooses to implement these recommendations depends on its level of paranoia, uh, what its regulators want. Uh, so this is effectively a document that's a basis for discussion, not uh, you know stone tablets from the mountain. Okay, so I have four minutes. I'll probably not spend much more time on this, but I want to sort of walk you through the structure of the document. So in the forces section, we'll simply say, these are the things you need to start paying attention to. The solution section is basically now a uh, set of statements about this is how you address the problems in the forces section. These are the things you might want to do. To do. And uh, when you go past that, uh, we have the expectation summary. So here in the left column, the numbers refer to the numbered arrows in the expectations matrix. So you can cross-reference them that way. Okay, so I, I will probably stop here uh, because again, I, I will need to drop in a couple of minutes, but uh, the links are shared in the chat. Uh, you're welcome to continue discussing them even after I drop. Uh, and uh, if you have an interest in uh, you know, having a hand in authoring these things, please join us at the GRC SIG. I'll give you a few other patterns we'll be working on. So the next one uh, is probably going to be, uh, we have a pattern around how do you upload, a, how do you up, uh, upgrade a workload for purposes of say blue-green deployment? And that one is almost ready. It's actually a very small document uh, and we'll be again, uh, either bringing it to the TAC or simply you know, publishing it soon. After that, a slightly more difficult one, we'll be talking about how to govern the attestation verification service itself. So we'll be talking about multi-tenancy, we'll be talking about how to ensure that the you know, policies that uh, you know, a customer uh, applies are in fact enforced. So you want, you want to make sure, because again, the attestation service is your absolute root of trust. So how to do that uh, securely is the subject of a pattern. Uh, and then more difficult pattern that I know we will need to tackle would be uh, around uh, break and inspect which is a dagger through any security person's heart, uh, but unfortunately is a requirement to regulated institutions that you need to be able to break and inspect traffic uh, and how to make that work with confidential computing. Uh, that one is probably going to be very contentious. Uh, so anyway, that's the end of my uh, short presentation here. Again, very much encouraging people to join us at the GRC SIG meetings. Uh, yeah, this, is, this is where the stuff is getting discussed. So uh, I'd like to say this is really important and what's more, very complex work. And my only concern I have at the moment is not that it's not being done well, but there are not enough eyes looking at it. And uh, to the extent that because these are really complex and big documents, I kind of feel either we need to ensure there are more people at the GRC on a regular basis, or we may need to say, does this need to come back into the TAC? And I don't, don't think that's the right thing to do, but I just worry that, there's we don't have enough this we don't have enough engagement on this um Martin, i was going to comment i was going to suggest that the link is in the chat um i i if you don't have the bandwidth to join the grc feel free to uh leave review comments this is a live document as mark says so if you leave review comments we can have an you know asynchronous conversation via email um where we take into account your comments ask for follow-up and then um, post whatever recommendations you have in the document once they pass the GRC. I think that's a good way to work. Cool. Yeah, uh, and in fact, uh, in the lead in for this meeting uh, on the mail list, everybody should have had the links to the document and been able to go in and provide that offline review. That's really the only way that we efficiently produce any of these documents. 
And again, in a sort of parting words, because again, I have a minute and I need to drop. Governance is about, uh, you know, having a set of guidelines, measuring what, like, you know, have basically explaining what your target state is. We have a document explaining this too. And then you need to measure what you're doing against these expectations. And then you need to figure out the delta between where you are and where you need to be. Right, that's a kind of a formal process, and need to create evidence around how you are meeting all of your expectations. So governance is regulators have real teeth. A bank can lose its banking license if uh, you know it fails audits. So uh, yeah, uh, it it is something that needs to be taken very very seriously. And Mark, how do you know when you are done with this document, and when do you think that might be? Uh, I would say once the uh, you know frequency of changes dies down and the comments are resolved, I, I think this document is pretty darn close. Uh, and again, if a bunch of people look at it and have a bunch of issues with it, then uh, we'll uh, you know we'll discuss it until we are you know we feel that it's in good enough shape, and then when, then then we'll move on. But uh, with this one, I'm hoping to be done soon, so we as can a, do other things. As a TAC member, Dan, here's what I would venture: I would venture that. We submit this document as the GRC to the TAC, put it open for review for a number of days. And um, once we address all the comments that come up for review or the number of days is expired, then it's accepted by the TAC and off we go. That sounds reasonable to me. Thank you all. I'm going to drop there. Thanks, Mark. I'll. I'll um, pile on and just say, as as we've been working through the GRC to finish up this document, uh, what we're trying to do at this point right now in an effort to shorten it up, and I think the, the TAC brought up some of these issues, is remove things that really are security um, issues that are very important and very necessary, but that aren't specific to confidential computing. So we've done some of that cleanup, because when you're in the in the throes of writing a document like this and you think of something that's really important, you throw it in there. Later, we have to go back through, trim out those bits that aren't specific to confidential computing. Um, I think the concern that Mark has and that was maybe brought out in a, in a good question during the discussion is um, why do you add these things that uh, are not specific to CC, like the existence of vulnerabilities in code that you lift and shift into CC? Our concern is that if we don't call these things out, when customers have uh, point out weaknesses in workloads running in confidential computing, we will be left defending um, non-confidential computing issues. We need to call those out in advance and say, yes, we understand that the risk isn't zero because of confidential computing. Confidential computing only helps with certain controls and certain risks. If you don't take advantage of the other things like a secure supply chain, you're still going to have data leaks. Confidential computing is not a magic bullet. So that's the, the sentiment that we're trying to capture in the doc. And with that, I'll close. Trying to figure out how to stop sharing. You never will. <laughs> if anybody else would like to look at Alex's email later in the day, just rejoin the meeting. Yeah, exactly. And feel free to answer as many as um as you have the bandwidth to. Honestly, I can't stop sharing this document. I can click share again, but I I don't see how to unshare it. So here's what I'm gonna do, Dan. I'm gonna take advantage of your mouse guiding skills and put you on on camera here redundantly. I don't remember where it indicates that because I'm not sharing, so I don't see what the widget is, but it might be on the share screen ah, button on the bottom. Good point. That's exactly where it is. If it, I have it uh, auto hiding, so I don't see it here. Honestly, I still don't see it. Ah, here it is. Nope. Sorry, guys. I can't stop sharing. Uh, let's just ignore me and move on with the rest of the meeting, Dan, while I fiddle with this thing. Um, worst case scenario, you could leave and rejoin. I don't think my pride could take that, Dan. I'm, I'm going to continue to fiddle with it.
you honestly you can't share over top of me. No. Um unless Ben has some superpowers. Uh I do not. Um Ah, here we go. Stop share. It just suddenly the the widget just appeared. I don't know what I did. I don't think I did anything. I think it just when I maximized my window, it uh suddenly gave me a button. Um tantalizingly present there is this button, but clicking on it does no good at all. So I will um I will drop and I'll join back in just a second. Hopefully the leave button works. If not, you guys are gonna get really sick of me really soon. All right, there we go. Um, at, at the risk that I will forever after be sharing myself, uh, I'm just going to bring up the agenda again. We're going to cut over to uh, TikTok momentarily. But uh, I remembered that Rian actually did add some announcements. Uh, he added in that there are three NIST documents that I guess we are responding to. Does this sound familiar? Uh, well, of course, we've just lost Alec. So maybe we'll come back to this. But anyway, there's there's uh, three documents listed here. And I don't know if these are things that we responded to earlier in the year or where these came from. So uh, we'll come back to that. But... He's back already. He just rejoined. Okay. Uh, Alec? Are you back with us? I am. I've got my audio and video working now. Excellent. So uh, Rian added three announcements that I had forgotten about uh, for this internal report, 8505, 8517, and 1836. Are these things that we already responded to? I can't remember. These look familiar. I'd have to go back through the notes. I can't, I don't recall. I know I did not add any review comments to any of the responses. I know there have been some responses. I don't know if these are the particular documents that were responded to. Okay, so maybe we'll take this to the to the mail list then. And we will um, invite in Vinny and Dale and Ming Shen to present here. And I see that now that I'm presenting, there is a red stop here button underneath the toolbar. Uh, but maybe if you hide the, the Zoom stuff, that disappears and doesn't return. Thank you, Dan. Um, yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, we have a project uh, that we would like to propose to the tech committee of CCC. And joining me today are two of our uh, research scientists. You already know Ming Shin and Dayol uh, as well. So uh, why don't we kick us off? Uh... So ju just just to be just to be clear, um, what you say you want to propose, the suggestion is that this be donated to the CCC, and you're asking the TAC to go through the process to recommend it to the governing board. Is that correct? That's correct, Mike. Yes. Excellent. Good. 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 Just so yeah, and clear. maybe. Um, <clears throat> just for everybody's benefit who hasn't been through this before, usually we have a meeting where we, we kind of understand the project in its uh, you know, functionality and, and what it's aiming to do. And then also uh, there's a list of, of things in the project submission that we go through. Uh, sometimes we can't get through all of that in one meeting, but typically we, we take uh, the intervening week to consider the project and add any other questions. And then we resolve all that in a, a second meeting and then if everything's going in the right direction, then we vote in the second meeting. So no vote today, uh, but we should be collecting all of the information and asking the questions today. Yeah. Right. Do you want me to take over? Yes, please okay. go ahead. Thank you. Right, do you guys see the screen? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Dial. Uh, yeah. I think. Um, just a second. Oh yeah, it works. So yeah. Hi, I'm Dial from TikTok, and um, I'm gonna talk about a project that we're working on. It's an open source project from TikTok, and um, um, as as um, Dan mentioned, we're hoping to donate this to CCC 
Um, so it doesn't have a, a like a, a finalized name, but we call it Privacy Code Data Clean Room, which is a secure and private platform for data collaboration via trusted environments. Um, so let me get started with the introduction of the project. So here's the overview of the talk. So I'll talk about what we're so, what problem we're solving um, and what are the ex uh, existing solutions and um, how is it different from our approach. Um, and then um, talk about the architecture um, and we'll talk about some use cases, um, potential like existing use cases at TikTok as well as potential use cases in the future. Um, and um, Vinny will continue talking about why we are planning to donate to CCC and why we think it's a good idea to have uh, our project in CCC. <clears throat> um, and then we'll basically uh, explain some project studios and um, growth plans in the future. So I'll start with the problem. So I'll start with um, um, the problem that we're solving for. So what we wanted to have is a data collaboration framework. Um, but let me um, define what the data collaboration framework is. The data collaboration framework allows multiple parties to collaborate on data. For example, a data provider um, may want to make their data available to um, some of the consumers so that the consumer can perform various analysis. So in this kind of framework, the data platform allows the data provider to control um, policies and data, for example, which data consumer can access this data or that data, or um, which data needs to be, um, you know, um, revoked, um, which access needs to be revoked. Um, the policy um, not only includes this kind of access uh, permissions, but also uh, we want to have some various privacy policies such as data retention um, or purpose limitation. Um, and the platform may also uh, provide data consumer with tools to utilize the data. It's not just sending the data and done, but but the platform can kind of allow users to really, you know, query the data, analyze the data using these tools. Um, so uh, one of the generalization of this kind of data collaboration framework um, which made available um, by, which was enabled by two trusted security environment is the multi-party, uh, multi-way data collaboration, where um, the multiple data providers and consumers can get involved in this kind of um, session of collaborations, right? So for example, there might be more than one party who wanna share their data. So there might be um, two or three data providers who want to share the data, but at the same time, they don't want consumer to like um, walk away with the data, right? But they still wanna collaborate with, with the data. Um, and also, um, each of the consumer can be um, the provider at the same time. So we call it prosumer. Um, so it's very flexible framework um, that we want to have. In a such multi-wide setting, the platform needs to provide the users with tools to securely collaborate with, uh, with each other. Um, obviously, there are two uh, main um, challenges here. Uh, one is security, the other is privacy. So security is very obvious. Um, you want to keep the data confidential. You don't want um, um, whoever is not supposed to access the data um, from keep uh, prevent them from access the data um, illegally, right? And also, you want to have some integrity of the data um, and consumption. Um, on the other hand, there's also privacy concern here. Um, especially when the data is um, highly privacy sensitive. So um, this is about how we can enforce different privacy policies. The examples are purpose limitation, um, which states that any data should be collected and processed for specific purposes, right? So we have to have a control over the data where, um, okay, so data consumer um, cannot use this data for a certain purpose. Um, also a data retention policy. So this is why we want to have, um, want to keep this, um, you know, data in the platform, um, you know, um, when the data um, is uh, expired, right? Um, you should revoke all, all access um, from the data consumer to the data that has expired, right? So data uh, only needs to persist um, for a defined period of time. 
we want to enforce this kind of security and um, privacy policy in this framework. Um, and it's, it's actually um, um, a little bit tricky. So uh, let me talk about goals. So our goal was to have a data collaboration platform, um, which has first usability. So it needs to provide an interactive tool to utilize data, such as querying interface. You, you should be able to um, you know, query the data, um, process the data, and analyze the data in, in a, uh, using these tools. Security, uh, uh, of course, um, you have to protect confidentiality and integrity of the data in use and provide strong access control. Um, in addition to security, as I mentioned, privacy is also very important. Important, So we need to make it possible to enforce these kind of privacy policies, such as purpose limitation and data retention. Um, and then um, accuracy, we would like to provide um, accurate results on real data, as well as an evidence of execution. So we don't want to, you know, um, approximate the result or, you know, add a noise or something, something like that. We just want the actual like result from the actual data. Um, and the final goal is um, it needs to be easy to deploy into the, uh, to the cloud or any other environments. So let me go through some existing solutions that we um, compared, um, that we that we explored. Um, there are as uh, SQL policy based based data clean rooms, um, which is very popular and common in in um, advertisement and marketing um, um, industry. Um, this is where a data platform um, is provided by a third party who does usually does not have any conflict of interest with any participants uh, of the collaboration. And usually, these solutions require data provider to configure, uh, let's say, fine grained SQL policies such as. Um, who can access, um, who can uh, run which query on which table in the database. It's very fine grained policy that, um, that needs to be set. Uh, the differential privacy, on the other hand, um, is based on mathematical foundation to limit information leakage of certain data set or queries um, by adding those to the, uh, either the data or the, or the aggregate result of the data. Um, and in addition, there was a proposed solution uh, based on trust execution environment. Um, the idea is to use remote attestation to co-verify the code before releasing the data and rely on hardware-based isolation um, environment to protect in-use data, right? So let me um, go through um, the technical difficulties of existing solutions. Um, None of these uh, meet all of our requirements that, that we found. And while policy-based uh, data claim room provides uh, great usability and accuracy, um, it is very hard to protect private data or to enforce privacy policy because uh, it's based on the fine grain SQL policy. Once um, the data consumer get the data, there's no way to control like how this data is used or how uh, you know prevent uh, the consumer from keeping the data. Um, and uh, differential privacy provides great usability, um, but it needs to sacrifice some accuracy. As you know, um, we our, one of our goal was to provide the accurate result on the actual data, but differential privacy kind of um, distorts the results by adding noise. Finally, the trust execute environment um, seems to be a good solution, but its attestation mechanism is not really usable for interactive interfaces, such as dynamic data querying or programming. Um, yeah, so that's uh, where we think about this approach of two-stage data climate room. So what I mean by two-stage um, um, is um, there are two stages in, in uh, the, uh, data collaboration. So the main idea is that um, uh, the, uh, there's a program stage and execution stage. And in the program stage, the programmer, um, the, each of the stage has different requirements and di different you know, characteristics. So in the program stage, uh, you only work with, uh, need a smaller data set and, and small compute um, to explore the data. Um, and it needs to be interactive, right? So you, you should be able to use some tool, interactive tools like Jupyter Notebook. Um, and because of that, it's very hard to control the data um, and it, ex uh, it exposes a higher privacy risk to the data. On the other hand, um, in execution stage, um, 
the program may um, you know want to run just uh, uh, the the complete program like once in the larger data, the actual data and compute. So it's pretty much a one-time execution. And because of that, it's easier uh, easier to control the data in this, this stage. And it should only run once. And um, because of that, it, the, the privacy risk is very um, low. So um, to this end, we have built um, this architecture where um, the data provider actually prepares to uh, provisions two different um, data sets. One is the synthetic data and the other is actual data. And then um, feed the synthetic data to the programming stage. Um, um, and once the data consumer is done with the programming stage, they can submit their job to the execution stage. And in execution stage, um, the, the workload run in the T instances, uh, which um, implements the you know isolated environment and also it provides some um, attestation to prove that they're running um, the right code um, and, and the data. And also the data provider can you know, set some permissions, uh, um, access controls based on the attestation. Right, so what's the benefit of two-stage data clean room, um, specifically with trusted execute environment? Um, so the data provider can decide a protection mechanism for the privacy. Um, what I mean is that at the programming stage um, for the synthetic data, um, the data provider is allowed to um, choose different synthetic, different types of synthetic data. For example, they can provide some, you know, completely random, random generated data, or they can provide some differentially private synthetic data or um, you know, public data, a part of data that is not um, privacy sensitive, for example. Um, and also at the execution stage, you still can uh, you know, um, provide some output, output privacy um, um, by doing the code and output filtering. Um, theoretically, uh, because this execution stage um, is very coarse grain, only happens in a while, um, once in a once in a while, so um, you can implement some coarse grain policy, like um, sanitizing the code or you know uh, reviewing the output, um, you know scanning the outputs uh, to make sure that the output doesn't contain any individual data and so on. Um, instead of per query policy in the interactive stage, you don't have to worry about uh, those policies in the program stage. So uh, what is good about trust, uh, using trust execution env environment? So it provides actually transition of trust in multi-way data collaboration settings. So data consumers or data providers, they don't have to trust each other. They just want to, they just um, <clears throat> need to trust the uh, P and the attestation. So it's, it, it provides some transition of trust, <clears throat> sorry. And it provides integrative code and output um, by using this attestation. Um, and then finally, uh, one other good thing about it is that the testing report of the, um, the the execution stage can be used as proof, proof of execution. <clears throat> so for any given output, they can prove that, oh, this was run by um, you know, the T um, in the data collaboration, uh, T-based data collaboration framework and from the, the specific you know, notebook. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, finally, uh, um, unlike the differential privacy, um, it provides accurate results in execution stage. Because um, in, in TE, you can have a, you can all of full access to um, the entire data. So we have built um, um, this data collaboration framework, the first version um, based on the, the cloud. Um, and, um, you know, we use the uh, server uh, open source solutions like Jupyter Hub, and the Jupyter Hub um, allows the users to program their code and access the uh, you know synthetic data set. And then once they're done, they can you know um, submit their job using uh, one of the Jupyter Lab plugin, um, and the plugin will talk to the data clean room API and you know manage the T instances. So I'll show the demo, a uh, quick demo. So, uh, sorry. 
Yeah, I think we missed the demo scenario, but the demo um, is uh, basically we want to um, analyze some some U.S. health insurance data, um, um, and then build a model using the XGBoost regression. Do you see the video by any chance? Not yet, but yeah, I I see. You, you see the screen. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So let me play it. So this is uh, uh, you, uh, where you can log in um, and the Jupyter Hub, you can create a, a notebook, install the dependencies. Um, and then what you're doing here is that you connect to a um, one of the Google Cloud Storage bucket, which contains this um, insurance data set, right? And then you can explore this data, but as you can see, it has a, it is a synthetic data uh, generated by differential privacy synthetic uh, data generation. So it has some statical um, characteristic of the data, but it does not leak any privacy in this program stage. So you can, um, you know, draw some correlation heat map between the between the columns. Uh, by the way, uh, we want to, you know, build a model um, to predict the, the insurance charge based on their, um, you know, features. For example, uh, the data contains um, uh, the age of the use age of the people, you know, whether they smoke or not, and, and so on. And we want to predict the charge. Uh, of the insurance, right? So once you're done with the exploration, you can submit this job and wait a while. Um, and then you can see that um, uh, the image is building in the back end. And once it's done, um, the, 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 um, the, the Docker image is running in the con uh, Google, Google confidential space, which is um, AMD SCP based um, TE. Then once the job is finished, you can download the output and then view um, how the uh, output looks like. And then this contains the very accurate result. And if you if you look at the correlation heat map, you can um, see very accurate correlation between the between the columns. So you can um, extract three features, which are age, um, smoker, and then the BMI, which um, has the greatest effect on the insurance chart. And then now we want to you know build a regression model using the XGBoost. We do um, all the same things like processing, pre-processing the data, and then we are um, going to build a model, uh, separate the train and test data set, um, and we're gonna create an XGBoost regressor model and then train it. Now, uh, once you're done with the data exploration, you can um, again submit to the data, data claim room API. Um, that will build uh, the image um, and then run and the in the back end, right? And then once it's finished, you can you can uh, check the output. Now you can see that the um, the model was trained um, pretty good, so the error is pretty small. Um, and then one other good thing about it is that um, you can access the attestation and report of this execution using this UI. Then you can verify that um, uh, the attestation report is a JAW token. So you can, um, you know, uh, compare the the key ID of the Google Computer Space, and then basically, you know, uh, copy this key and 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 verify the signature by yourself. Um, and in the testing report, you can see that um, okay, so this runs in Computer Space. Um, it has an image digest of this, which is reproducible um, on your own. And it also um, includes some extra information like what command was run and what are the environment variables and so on. Um, finally, um, you can also um, see that the the um, the the the, uh, the attestation report um, you know is generated by um, by this. Sorry, the output is generated by this specific workload. You can, uh, you know, get the MD5 hash of this output file, and then compare it with one that in the in the testing report. So that, yeah, that's um, that's end of the demo. And um, Vinny, do you want to take over? Sure. Awesome. Uh, can you keep continuing sharing, Adar? Uh, yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah, so as you looked at uh, Dio's demo, um, you know, we 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 have like a working solution in our environment as well. So let me 
start by why uh, Privacy Go Data Clean Room was built and its use cases. Next screen. So TikTok, as you know, has over a billion of users on our platform. And when we build products and features for our platform, we do so by keeping uh, privacy in mind and building privacy, uh, building in privacy principles throughout our software uh, uh, development lifecycle. Next slide. Next slide. And for that, like, you know, running a large platform uh, at scale like ours also means that it is important to provide transparency and it is a critical responsibility of large social media platforms like TikTok, as the data can be very valuable for many public domains, public health, economic impact, understanding cultural trends, civic engagement, etc. And at TikTok, we aim to provide as much transparency as possible to the com community. And it is also important that we respect the privacy of our user data. Next slide. So uh, PGDCR, our solution started as a use case for uh, important internal use. Virtual compute environment is a solution that TikTok, uh, at TikTok that provides maximum transparency to the researchers with minimal privacy risks. And uh, TikTok's VC actually leverages this two-stage data clean room approach to balance privacy and transparency. Next slide. However, there are many other use cases where this project is valuable. For example, within ads and marketing uh, space, ads is a very popular use case of data collaboration frameworks. Uh, and PGDCR can be used for lookalike segment analysis for advertisers or ad tracking uh, with uh, private user data. Uh, within machine learning space, PGDCR can be useful for machine learning, which involves private data or models. You already saw a dial uh, demo on Jupyter Notebook where we ran some XGBoost model. So it's a very um, data scientist friendly uh, framework. For example, a private model provider can provide their model for fine tuning and they do not reveal the actual model in the programming stage, but when they move to secure execution stage, the real um, data and real model can be run in a very uh, secure confidential space. Next slide. Um, so current status of the project, we are uh, actually releasing uh, an, an alpha, uh, we released an alpha version, which may miss some necessary features. It offers one-way collaboration right now, and uh, current version uses Google Cloud Platform as a backend, and uh, we support computation on CPU. The data provisioning policy and attestation is manual for the current version. However, we have a full-blown uh, growth plans, which includes expanding to multi-way collaboration for users, um, platform extensibility to support multiple backends. Uh, bringing automation to data provisioning policy and attestation. Uh, and we want to support compute on both CPU and GPU. Next slide. And recognizing the importance of collaboration and uh, transparency, we released this project in open source as of June 6th, uh, 2024, which was also at the compute, uh, Confidential Compute Summit in San Francisco. You can also check it out on GitHub. Uh, I dropped the link in the chat. Uh, now let me talk about alignment with uh, CCC um, and why it is valuable to the CCC community. We, by providing an open source solution based on TE technology, we diversify the confidential computing landscape. Uh, we want to accelerate the uh, CC adoption. Um, so. Currently, as you can see, we have showcased a use case focused approach and we demonstrated how confidential computing can be used to enable advanced use cases for industry demands. Generative AI and AI was talked about a lot even during uh, CC summit. So uh, we, we have to have this technologies to accelerate the CC adoption uh, in those industry demands uh, and use cases as well. And third, we want to uh, drive underlying confidential computing technology to become more mature. Um, Tayol shared how we are leveraging Google Cloud confidential space uh, and AMD. We want to work with more such technologies and want those solutions to become more mature. Next slide. Um, and then 
open collaboration. Um, so we are currently integrated with many technologies, including uh, you know many clouds, and we want to expand that uh, to uh, to further integrations as well. And currently, the solution can also work on existing open source infrastructures. Um, so by doing that, we want to support better platform uh, and do more collaboration with the open source community. Next slide. And uh, there are a few great resources to check us out. Uh, we have a website. You can find us at privacyinnovation.io. Uh, we also have GitHub and we welcome contributions. So if you want to work on any uh, collaborative project, please feel free to uh, uh, reach out to us and we, we are happy to schedule one-on-ones. Um, we also have a lot of social channels where we regularly post about our updates and participation at Confidential Computing and other uh, summits. So please check, it out, check us out there. Yeah, with that, I think, next slide. Thank you. We, we can take questions now. Great presentation, an interesting project. Uh, <clears throat> questions from, from anybody? I'll start. Um, so what languages are you using? Uh, we're using Go. Golang for the cool. data claim API. Um, yep. And then for the um, Jupyter um, notebook, um, it's basically, um, you know, yeah, it's it's just a uh, front end code, which is based on the Python. Sure. And uh, in terms of uh, contributors, are all the contributors currently TikTok folks? And, and how many contributors are there? Uh, yeah, right now, all the contributors are TikTok so far. Um, I think it's uh, five or six tours. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mingxin. Yeah, I think it's five. five. Shows, shows two. Yeah, so um, you mean the GitHub, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, just thought we... of, I just followed the link that Vinny posted to the chat here. That's all I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we do have an internal um, you know, repo, and we kind of transferred. So our internal policy um, doesn't allow us to, like, open, like, just, you know, open source, like everything that we have in an internal. So that's why we kind of initial, initiated the, you know, the repository from the scratch in the GitHub. Um, but internally we have uh, more and more people working on it. And presumably part of the reason you want to be uh, donating it to the uh, CCC is so that you can grow the number of contributors and the, and the organizations contributing, right? Yes. Excellent. That's correct. That's it from me for now. And also, Mike, uh, since you know we come from a user landscape as well, user of technology, mm. uh, we want to integrate our solution with more of like providers as well. So it will be helpful collaboration, uh, you know, with existing uh, landscape of CCC members. Sure, that makes sense. Uh, so I, I have a technical question. I, I didn't quite understand the mechanism that restricts access to data in the clean room. Could you dig in on that for me? Yeah, so basically it's um, it's separate. So I think in the in the in the architecture, um, the platform doesn't allow um, any data access from non T instances. So before you access the data, um, there is a, a access control based on the attestation. So any instances that um, wants to access data, they need to you know perform the attestation. So any specific workload, only the specific workload that was pre-approved um, in the system will be able to access data. Okay, so it, you're getting an attestation that something's running in a TE, but the TE doesn't really prevent uh, a certain behavior. You need to have that behavior pre-approved. So there's yes. a, 
all right, so there, there's some sort of manual step here of somebody reviewing code. Uh, so that, yeah, that part we are um, still figuring out, but I think um, you can do it manual, but um, mm -hmm. also you can put some, you know, very basic automated um, sanitizing, right? So you can filter out or sandbox the code and so on. Those are like all pos uh, possible options to do that. But yes, um, I think the code filtering needs to happen before um, before the execution stage should be able to um, export the result back to the consumers. Okay, thanks. And then the, Vinny, thanks for copying the API location and the repo. Can you, explain the relationship between the the API and any of the enforcement mechanisms. API and the any of the enforcement. Oh, so um, yeah, API um, will, let me pull up the, yeah, so the API will manage the, um, the cloud resources, um, but, Right now, the Google Cloud um, supports Google Cloud Configure uh, Space supports the attestation-based um, data access control. Um, so it's prim primarily based on the cloud, um, the, the attestation-based data data access, uh, as well as you know the output control, output permission control that is based on the attestation in the cloud provided by the cloud. And then API um, basically just, um, you know, deals with the um, the permission from the Jupyter Hub user to the the, the cloud, um, you know, resources. Does that okay. answer your question? I, I think so. This the API is really more about managing the cloud instance than it is about. Uh, it's not really an like a query API that somehow restricts interaction. Yeah, that's correct. So the Jupyter Hub will be able to access the data, the synthetic data. Data Clean Room API will just tell which URL that they need to access, and the actual uh, access control is done by the cloud configuration. Okay. Thanks. I see uh, Catherine's hand raised, and then Fritz is after that. Um, just a quick question um, about the separation of two stages. If I understand it correctly, the introduction of the uh, programming stage is mainly for debugging, like because you don't have, you know, all the um, enforcement of security. Then it's yes. much easier to, uh, you know. To, to, to okay, so, so it, it's so not it's, essential for the security purpose. It's not essential for the security purpose. Uh, it is a balance of uh, uh, privacy and usability uh, for the programming stage. It's not just for debugging. A researcher can do some preliminary uh, uh, analysis on the data understand some uh, statistic information or understand some like something some, find some insight from the data and then uh, they can submit uh, a job on the actual data to get a, a more accurate result Does that make okay. sense? thank you yeah I had a similar question in a similar direction so um that basically means it's it's it has to be a two-step system right where the data provider first sends the synthetic data then uh the programming stage is done well yeah, end step but then the programming stage is done then you upload to the tee the data provider checks what you want to do on the data and only then gives access to the actual data right or well that's the only way i i, I see it uh working because otherwise uh yeah, you can't check what's being run on the actual data, right? Is that is that correct, my understanding? Yeah, for now we don't have that. As I uh, mentioned, we only support uh, you know one way collaboration. Um, but in the future, we would like to have automated data provisioning policy management. So right now, it's true that you know um, the TE will run and then the output will be generated. Uh, but there's 
in the demo, we didn't show uh, the way to filter the output so the consumer can download the output, but tech, tech, uh, the, uh, ideally that should be limited by, by controlled by the data provider. So once the data provider approves the code, um, only then um, the consumer will be able to submit the job and, and download the output. I see, because so, uh, my next question would then be as a follow-up for like your future plans, if you already have an idea there, um, is your multi-way collaboration, is it like, uh, um, of course you don't have that yet, but, but is it planned to also combine multiple data sources um, into one or is multi-way collaboration something else? I think there, there could be multiple data sources um, from different people um, as long as the, the data provider um, configures the data accessibility to um, the, the consumer, they can actually leverage multiple data sources in one notebook. Right, because then what it's do mean worse, by... right? Then you need to review, like then every data provider would need to review what's being done on the data before giving access to it. And then one might rescind their approval or something like that. So there's like lots of things that can go wrong. Just wanted to figure out if, if, if I understand the issues. Yeah, so um, our initial, this is just like initial primary idea. So we don't, we don't yeah, know like what, what we'll do, but um, our initial idea is that um, there are two places uh, where you can filter. So one is the code filtering. So you can sanitize the code. You can, you can, you can scan the code um, um, and understand the code, right? That part can be automated or, or could be done manual. The second part um, that you can prevent um, the data leakage is the output filtering, right? So once you uh, basically, after the, the workload is run, if the workloads, uh, any output of the workload, if they are kept inside um, PE and never, um, you know, passed to the data consumer, right? That doesn't leak anything. Um, so um, I think what, we're envisioning that the code filtering um, is very hard um, to do manually. So code filtering can happen automatically to provide some insight and, and you know, filter out some very obvious things like transferring the data, dumping the data to, uh, to the network and, and so on, right? That can be filtered out in the code filtering. But um, if it passes code filtering, it will run in T anyways, and it will, the T will generate the output. Uh, but at this point, the output needs to be, um, you know, reviewed. Um, but I think um, the the hard part is that you know the manual manual filtering doesn't work here. Um, really, uh, does it's not going going to work right here, because um, you know uh, if the output turns out to leak some data, um, leak some data of one of the data provider, um, then as as soon as they see this output, uh, it will um, you know leak the data. So it's kind of challenging to make it right, but there should be some automated um, um, steps here. Um, we we don't know like how hard it would be to be honest, but I think it's not impossible to put some basic automated um, filtering of the output or the code. Interesting. Thanks. So. Um... Dan, am I okay to uh, speak? I'm not sure who else is in the queue. Uh, I don't see anybody else in the queue. It's all you. Cool. So I was just going to say uh, these are great questions about about the project. Uh, it's really nice that people are showing lots of lots of interest. Uh, I was wondering if we should think about what we need to know in order to be able to uh, move on to a vote. And and you know, are, are there any specific questions we need to be uh, asking in order to help us through the process of, of recommending uh, this project or not, um, just in terms of the process. Yeah, and I guess that, that would be sense. a question again. So what, uh, what we have linked is the uh, submission document, and that asks questions about things like licensing and, and so forth, and, and taking a quick glance at the repo. Uh, you know, it's open source licensed, and I, I don't think we're going to have a, an issue with, with any of that. Um, but please, uh, TAC members, please review those criteria and um, do raise any questions that you see there. We'll review those steps in detail next session. 
Uh, the other thing that we also look for, not as a precondition necessarily, but uh, we like to see multiple companies collaborating. Uh, certainly for advancement in the maturity stages, uh, you need to grow the contributor and maintainer bases. Um, but the, and, the yeah, more- as you say, we don't necessarily require that now, but we lo- we love to see a growth a growth plan and to have exactly it, this yeah how that how this would actually happen. Yeah, sorry, Dan. Nope, that's uh, reasserting what I was what I was saying there. So that's good. Um, so I, I think that's that's it in a nutshell. Is we have to make sure that we we've got all the boxes checked there. From the the thing that's a little bit less precise is understanding the the technical benefit of a project, and that's where as subject matter experts on the council, uh, we do need to have good dialogue. Uh, one of the things that I'll, I'll be looking at in between this meeting and the next is trying to understand what this project provides for somebody wanting to engage in the use case. Uh, These problems of how you prevent data leakage through queries is very difficult. And and I don't quite grok yet uh, what, what facilities there are in the project to make that easier for somebody trying to adopt this. Do do we feel that 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 is a gating function? It's a nice to have, but I wouldn't. I, I wonder whether that is something which would cause us not to accept it. You know, with as long as we're showing that this is a project which is you know, moving things on, the specific choices about implementation um, aren't necessary. I mean, it, obviously, something we'd like to engage with. But you know, is this is this moving on adoption or possibility for adoption of uh, of confidential computing seems to be the the key question. Am I misrepresenting? Yeah, I don't want to necessarily say that that the question that I'm raising is a blocker, but we do need to make sure that there's there's enough technical substance. So. It, Anybody can put an, an open source project out in very early stages, and that's often a great way to, you know, putting something out earlier than later is what I always encourage companies to do, because you bring people along for the, you bring people along the journey of of how and why decisions are made and how you grow that functionality. For us to bring something in to help highlight it as a community, we want it to though have progressed to a certain level of value. And so if if the intent of a project is to solve some hard problem, if there's not a premise of how that problem is being solved, and I'm not making that pronouncement for this project, but just as an example, I don't think that that would meet the bar for me to encourage the adoption of that project. Let me add something, um, Dan. Uh, mm-hmm. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please. Yeah, I, I want to say that, you know, in terms of, uh, I can a- answer uh, one of the questions, uh, which is like, you know, technological um, uh, uh, a problem that we are solving. So this solution evolved as a use case for TikTok itself. So we have been using it in like solving our own uh, internal technical um, uh, technical uh, challenge. So it, it is it is kind of a viable solution that we want to put it put it out there and we want to see like how we can work with others to make more mature technology per, per se. So mm-hmm. just want to add that there. Yeah, I think that adds a lot of merit if TikTok is using it for solving a business problem. And I didn't quite get you mentioned that um TikTok provides transparency, and this is uh, a means of providing that data. Uh, I wasn't quite clear what that transparency was on. Is it on private user data, or what was that intended? So, yeah, good question, Dan. So if you look at our developers.tiktok.com, there is research APIs, and we provide some functionalities for developers. 
So you kind of, you can kind of explore uh, that when we meant by, explore, uh, you know, maximi maximum transparency. So this is not exactly uh, solving for the search API, but uh, we kind of use the solution in the, um, they kind of leverage the solution in the backend. Okay, and that's providing access to what kind of data? Yeah. Catherine, you got a lot of feedback on your, on your line. Um, yeah, I think perhaps, I think the project, I mean, the presentation can uh, provide more kind of uh, information on what are the main, you know, challenges that um, you encountered um, in your particular usage case and, um, and make a case for that those challenges would be um, kind of general for other, um, you know, a, a, other companies who may have set similar like needs and, and challenges. So this technology then, um, you know, can be generalized for those usage cases as well. I don't see that kind of emphasized in the presentation. I'm kind of interested in more of that aspect is it's solving a real need uh, for the general public, not just for TikTok. It's a TikTok problem, but it can also be a problem for other companies as well. So basically, basically I think if you can articulate, you know, along that uh, angle, I think then then I think it's a, it's an interesting. Uh, very interesting proposal. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, I can speak uh, uh, for this question. Um, uh, I think the general uh, use case for this solution is uh, to target the uh, trusted uh, research environment, which is, uh, is a um, very uh, unique domain at the, uh, like for the uh, health the insurance company and the public sectors they want to share data to researcher and how to balance the um, privacy and the uh, uh, usability of the data. So if you look at the trusted research environment, um, uh, search this term uh, in EU and UK, in EU countries, uh, some of the um, um, I would say organizations that uh, make uh, their uh, creating standards to um to create such environment uh, for research access data uh, data access so uh for this project we at the first state at the first case we are targeting um to have a, like a similar solution to help research access more data from uh, different organizations with the confidence of the uh, privacy of the data so that's the um um I think, yeah, to answer your question, the main challenge, uh, both technical challenge and also from the product side, the challenge is how to balance the usability of and the utility of the um, some data and the uh, private privacy of that data. So yeah, um, that's my answer. So if, if you need uh, actual like document uh, and uh, uh, materials background we can send over later. I think having those sorts of data uh, and documents uh, is always useful. So if you could send those to the TAC mailing list, um, the more materials there are to look at, the easier it is for people to get their head around, I think. Definitely. Uh, and and also uh, just for, for everybody's benefit and for future projects, uh, we've been working in the background with with uh, meeting and, and crew here to get get the uh, submission out today. Uh, the usual process is all the stuff should go to the mail list, and that way people who aren't available during the meeting time also get fully informed on the project. So. Uh, It'd be great to get the links and the uh, submission document to the list if it isn't already. 
And um, then for the submission document, I think it's the technical charter um, and for IP and trademarking, we still work with the legal team, right? Legal team of LF. Yeah, I'll, Vinnie, I'll, I'll coach you in, uh, through all those steps. Yeah, the, um, there's, there's a questionnaire that's in the GitHub repo in, in um, one of the links that I sent you. That's sort of like the first thing that we have to do. Once that's done and the TAC approves, I'll work with you on um, working with the LF legal team. Uh, you don't have to worry about a charter or anything. We dropped all that stuff for you. Yeah. And also to add that we we are already under Apache 2.0 license. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super helpful. Yeah, definitely. One of the most important things. Okay, well, with that, we are out of time. Thank you for the excellent project submission. Yeah, and thank you. Everybody is encouraged to review the materials so that we can come to a, a decision in our next meeting. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, thank folks. Have a good one. Bye. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Thanks, Finney and folks. That was a great presentation.